as we uh, look into this third week of man of God, I'm going to look at the life of Timothy one more time. And as I was reading through first and second Timothy again, just picking out some things about Timothy's life, it, it was clear to me that Timothy overcame a lot of excuses, overcame a lot of obstacles to be the only person in the New Testament called a man of God. He overcame some obstacles. And so we're going to look at how to find the way to win, because this is what Timothy did, how to find the way to win. How many of you want to win in life? Everybody wants to win in life. I don't think anybody sets out and just wants to lose. But if you're not careful, losers will find excuses, but winners will find a way. Losers, all, there will always be plenty of excuses why you don't win in life, but winners will find a way. So in honor of my 60th birthday was this, this past week. I, oh yeah, yeah. I'm feeling good about it. I'm feeling good. I'm going to share 60 lessons learned from Timothy. Y'all with me? I see somebody frantically shaking their head no back there. What? No, not 60? Okay, how about six? We'll do six. How about that? Right. <laughs> Lazy sluggards. All right, let's just deal with six of them. Six Six obstacles or lessons we learn from the life of Timothy, and I'm just going to share them, then I'll show you the sportive scripture to them. But the first is this. Timothy did not allow his ethnicity to hold him back. I'm, I'm telling you this because we are in a season of our, 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 our nation and our world where it seems like people are allowing ethnicity to hold them back. Look at this. In Acts 61, Paul came to Derbe, to Lystra, disciples there named Timothy, son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So he was uh, a biracial, neither fully Jew nor fully Greek. But the truth is our heritage shouldn't be a factor when it comes to God. The color of our skin shouldn't be a factor. Now, the world that we live in is, is I mean, heavily insistently trying to divide us and push us into different uh, corners of our world based on our skin color, based on our politics, based on our financial status, our neighborhoods. Come on, you know, when we live in a certain neighborhood, I can start calling names, but you know which ones I'm talking about. Our communities are the cities that we live in. You know, some of you people that live in a different city than others. The way we talk, even within cities like Plano West, Plano, Plano East, they all got their own rivalries in the, in the city of Plano. Even Dallas versus Fort Worth. You know, the Fort Worth people just don't like the people in Dallas. How many of you are from Fort Worth? Uh, I got, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know. Uh, we just, it's just different worlds, completely different worlds. But we're, we're divided by our professions, blue collar versus white collar. We're divided by choice, vaccine, no vaccine, mask, no mask, gather, don't gather, uh, social distance, don't social distance, pro-life, pro-choice, uh, gay, straight, conservative, liberal, woke versus still have some backbone and common sense. Uh, the, we're pushed into these different corners and we're not even allowed to have an adult conversation with differing opinions. Uh, we're, we're forced to submit to another's idea or be canceled. Let me tell you something. Division is from the devil. Romans 16, 17. Look at this. Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you learn. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. There are plenty of people serving their own appetites, trying to create infighting within the church, within the community, within our country. No, no, they're not serving the Lord Christ, but their own appetites by smooth talk and flattery. They deceive the minds of naive people. Do not be deceived. We need to be building together, not tearing apart. We need to be uniting, not dividing. We need to be standing arm in arm, not giving each other the stiff arm. We need to be supporting each other, not destroying each other. We need to be building each other up, not tearing each other down. Can I get an amen? You see, sin separates, but God unites. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said it like this. And so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, 
He said, I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but the content of their character. Timothy did not allow his ethnicity to hold him back. He didn't allow it to be an excuse to not be used by God. And none of us should as well. You, not one of us could do anything about the color of our skin, but we can the way we treat one another. We cannot allow our skin color to be, or to be an excuse or to live as a victim because of our skin color. Here's the second lesson that I, I see in Timothy's life. He, he, his father was not his spiritual father. His father wasn't his spiritual leader. His father was not the spiritual impact in his life. Second Timothy 1 5, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I'm sure dwells in you as well. In fact, we don't see much about Timothy's father in his life. It appears that he was an unbelieving Gentile, leaving his mother and his grandmother to have the spiritual impact in his life. Now, there are many type of fatherless homes. You don't have to uh, be absent from the home to be an absentee father. You can be absent spiritually. You can be absent mentally. You can be absent emotionally, even if you're there physically. But it's very clear that the fatherless home has had the greatest negative impact in our nation, second to none. In fact, the National Center for Fathering said this, that 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of runaway children from fatherless homes. 85% of children who show behavioral disorders from fatherless homes. 80% of rapists from homes, uh, from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts from fatherless homes. 75% of adolescent patients in chemical abuse centers from fatherless homes. 85% of youth who are in prison from fatherless homes. 71% of pregnant teenagers from fatherless homes and well over 90% of felony cases across the nation committed by defendants from fatherless homes. It seems like nothing leaves a larger scar on our lives than fatherlessness. So I'm challenging the fathers to step up, be the man of God. I'm challenging men, be a man of God. Women, be a woman of God. Let's be children of, don't allow the fact that you didn't have a spiritual father or a father present in your life to be your excuse for not winning in life. I know it's, it makes life challenging, but it doesn't mean that you can't win. Timothy shows us he didn't have the father in his life that we would hope, that we would all hope to have, but it didn't hold him back. And you can use a fatherless home as an excuse, or you can recognize the challenges that it presents, and then you can find a way to win. That's what Timothy did. And that's what every one of us have to do as well. Most, a lot of people know that my grandparents were ministers, were preachers, Assembly of God preachers. And of course, my father, Assembly of God preacher, and my brother and myself and my children, and many people think that, oh, and I've, ha I've had people tell me, yeah, you were lucky. You know, your grandparents were in the ministry, your parents in the ministry, you kind of got lucky. The fact is, it didn't start with my grandparents. My mother's sitting right over here and she'll tell you that my mother and my father both were saved as kids through a ministry of a local church like a VBS where record numbers this year of over 500 kids, 150 or more workers. It was crazy around there this week. But through a ministry of a local church reaching out to children, just like we did this last week, my mother and my father got saved in homes that didn't serve the Lord. They got saved and started serving the Lord and both of them had the impact upon their families and their parents came to know the Lord and then later called into the ministry. You can sit around and you can say, well, I didn't have a spiritual mom and dad in my home. I didn't have that role model. Well, you didn't. Well, then you be the one. You be the role model. You may be the one who leads your parents to the Lord. Rather than allowing the lack of spiritual leadership in your home to be your excuse, make it the reason why you choose to live for the Lord. Third lesson that we see in Timothy's life is that he learned how to thrive in Paul's shadow. He was a second stringer, but rather than allowing that to be his excuse to quit, he just continued to thrive. 
Paul makes this point in 1 Corinthians. I think this is funny here in 1 Corinthians 4, 16. It says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So here's what Paul was saying. Hey, you Corinthians, I'm sending Timothy to you. He's gonna tell you to look at me. He's gonna tell you to watch me. And then I'm gonna tell you to follow Christ. He's not gonna come to you as the role model for you to follow after. He's just gonna point you back to me as the role model and I'm gonna point you to Christ. And instead of that being a sticking point for Timothy and saying, well, no, I wanna be the focal point. He just chose to rise above and win instead of that. There's a whole lot of us that are gonna live as second stringers in our lives or in our work or in our family. And you can either let it be an excuse or you can find a way to win. You think about the, uh, the second string quarterback or you think about the housewife who's a substitute teacher for the elementary school down the street or you think about the nurse who has the beeper clipped to her blue jeans while she's out shopping uh, or the vice president in any corporation. What do they all have in common? They are all waiting in the wings. They are all the ones who standing ready to step in when the number one slot is vacant. Maybe you're the wingman. Maybe you're the protege. Maybe you're the understudy. Maybe you're the assistant. Rather than using that as an excuse to sulk and gripe and complain and be MIA, why don't you step up and be the best second stringer you possibly can be? Because one of these days your number's going to be called and you're going to be, it's, it's, you're going to be expected to step into that role and be your very best. So you have to be your best right now to be in position to step in when the time is right. That's what we learn from Timothy. I mean, you think of Elijah and Elisha, David and Jonathan, Paul and Timothy. They all had their season of leading. They all had their season of following. We can sit around and say, well, this is not where I want to be, but is it where you are? Then be the best where you are. And then God will promote you to where he wants you to be. Here's the fourth. He needed guidance and instruction. Timothy still laid into his ministry, needed guidance and instruction. Now, listen, I know guys, we're the worst. We don't like to take instructions. Still to this day, in fact, we were walking around looking for something in the, in the department store the other day and Starla said, what would you tell me to do? I tell you to go ask somebody and get some directions. <laughs> I said, but I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep looking, I'll find it. I don't <laughs> Because I'm just hard-headed. I am. I recognize it. We won't stop and ask for directions. And, you know, anyway, we're just that way. But the, the fact is, every single one of us, we need guidance and instruction in our lives. Why? Because we all have blind spots. You need somebody to be able to point out blind spots. You need somebody to hold you accountable. You need somebody to stand in the gap with you. Look at these three scriptures where Paul gives Timothy some instruction. Look at this. He said, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. In other words, he's telling him, listen, don't, don't fall into that trap. He's giving it guidance and instruction. And rather than Timothy getting an attitude saying, look, you don't need to tell me I'm grown. I can handle this. That's what I would say. I'm grown. And then Starla would slap me. <laughs> Second Timothy 1.8. Don't be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. He's just telling, don't be ashamed, giving him guidance and instruction. Look at this other scripture, 1 Timothy 3, 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Now, you could take that. I know how to act in church. Why is Paul writing Timothy, tell him how to act? Because sometimes we need to be told how to behave. Sometimes we just need some guidance and we need some instruction. Every one of us need it. And that's what we learned from Timothy. He didn't allow his pride to get in the way. He took the instruction and he took the guidance from Paul and it made him a better man. Here's the next lesson in worship team. Come on back. He was young for his age and everybody 20 and under said, amen. Y'all were slow on that one. Everybody 20 and under said, amen. Okay. Look, Timothy's exact age isn't really given. But 
We know that Paul encouraged him not to allow anyone to despise his youth, but set the believers an example in speech. In other words, you're young, but don't allow your youthfulness to keep you from setting an example, meaning even as a young person, even as a teenager, he was an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Don't allow your youthfulness and don't allow your old age. Don't allow your age at all to be an excuse why you don't set an example for being like Christ. And you think of people like David. He was just a teenager when he took out Goliath. Jeremiah was told, even as a young man, to be mighty, to be used of God. Mary was just a teenager when she bore the Christ child, the son of God, Miriam, Esther, Joseph, the young lad with the five loaves and the two fish, all of them were young when God chose to use them. Being in junior high doesn't mean you're a junior varsity Christian. You can be used at any age if you're willing to be used by God. I love this great story of Bob Lupton. He tells the story how when he was just seven years of age, he went to a Billy Graham concert. Crusade. (laughs) You didn't know Billy Graham had concerts. He was a great rock and roll (laughs) musician before he became the greatest evangelist of all time. News you can use, but it's not true. Kind of like CNN. What? 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 Anyway, uh, Bob Lupton goes to this crusade, a Billy Graham crusade. Seven years of age, he hears this altar call and he asks his mom, can I go forward? And he goes forward. In that moment, his life has changed. He starts following after the Lord. And even as a young adolescent, every afternoon he would come home from school and he would do his devotions. He would read his Bible. He, was, he would pray right after he did his homework. He's 14 years of age. He's at home having his devotions. Unusual for most kids that age, but he was committed. He's in his home and he, in his room, reading the Bible, praying, and he felt like the Lord nudged him to go across the street to a guy in their neighborhood known as Uncle Billy. He was, uh, lived in the adjacent duplex to his best friend, Jimmy, and it was Jimmy's uncle, Uncle Billy, and everybody knew him in the neighborhood. He was, he was a drunk. Nobody messed with him, but they all knew him, Uncle Billy, and he felt this impression to go across the street walk up to Uncle Billy and ask him, are you ready to meet God? Bob Lupton said, I'm not going over there. He he might get mad. He might throw me out. I've barely even spoken to him. So he kind of pushed that nudging aside and went out to play. Couldn't get the heaviness, couldn't get that burden off of his chest. So he went back in and started praying some more realized he had to do something about it. So he bargained with God. He said, okay, God, I'll go over there. But if he's not out on his porch, I'm not saying anything. So he walked out there and luckily he wasn't on his porch. So he went back home. Couldn't get rid of that feeling. That feeling, you know, when God tells you to do something, you just got to do it or die. So he finally walked across the street and he knocked on the door. And Uncle Billy opened the door. Thankfully, he was sober. Little Bobby walked into his duplex. And after some formal greetings, how you doing? How's your day? He looked up at Uncle Billy and he said, are you ready to meet God? Kind of took Billy back. Wasn't expecting that coming from this kid. But he walked over to the bookshelf and pulled out an old dusty family Bible and brought it over to Bobby and opened it up and showed him. And there on the left side of the page was his baptismal certificate. And on the page across was a letter of confirmation. Well, little Bobby, he didn't know the significance of these documents and he certainly didn't know anything about their traditions or heritage or anything. It was a German version and So just innocently, he looked back up at Billy and said, but uh, are you ready to meet God? And that's when Billy 
looked at him in the eyes and said, I believe I am. Bobby felt the burden lift, walked out, forgot about it for a few days until his best friend across the street, Jimmy, came up to him and said, did you hear about Uncle Billy? He says, no, no what? He says, my dad found Uncle Billy dead this morning. He's been dead in his duplex for four days. That's when Bobby realized he was probably the last person to ever speak to Uncle Billy. When God wants to get somebody's attention, it's up to God to decide who he wants to use. It's not up to us to try to talk him out of it or to come up with excuses. It's up to us to find a way to do what God calls us to do, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it doesn't pass the logic test. If God says to go tell somebody about Jesus, if he says go pray for somebody, if he says get up in the middle of the night, if he says give money to somebody, if he says go give that person $20 or go buy groceries for this person or just be there for this person, who are we to try to argue with God? It's our job to make sure that we're just simply doing what God tells us to do. Don't use your age as an excuse. Losers find excuses. Winners find a way. We've just got to find a way to do what God has called us to do. Here's the last thing. Timothy had a heart for God. He simply just had a heart for God. Look, look at what Paul says about him here as he writes to the Philippians. He said, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. They all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. Why? Because he had proven himself to not operate in his own interest, but the interest of Jesus. Why? Because he had a heart for God. I'm asking you to go after a heart for God. I'm asking you to make your mind up here on this Father's Day 2021 to go after a heart for God to make sure that your heart beats with the heartbeat of God. If you've ever been to the Alamo in San Antonio, it's very possible you've seen this little portrait that's there on the wall near the main entrance. It's a portrait, James Butler Bonham. It says no picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It's placed here by the family so that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. No picture of James Butler Bonham. So they put a picture that resembled him so people would know what he looked like. The truth is that there's no literal picture of Jesus Christ either. There's no true portrait of Jesus. So how do we know what Jesus looks like? My hope and my prayer is that there will be enough people here in this house, enough people watching this service online that would have such a heart for God that when it comes to looking like Jesus, they could say, what does Jesus look like? He looks like my daddy because my daddy has a heart for God. What does Jesus look like? He looks like your daddy because your daddy has a heart for God. I want you to have a heart for God. I want people to say he looks like Jesus because he loves like Jesus. He looks like Jesus because he leads like Jesus. He looks like Jesus because he is faithful like Jesus. I'm looking for some people here today in this house that are willing to follow hard after God, that are willing to say, God, put your heart inside of me because when people look at me, I don't want them to see me. I want them to see Jesus. Come on, is anybody with me here today? Yesterday was June 19th. Now a new federal holiday to remember the day when Union soldiers made their way to Galveston, Texas with the message that slavery had been abolished by the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln, a day that we should never forget. But history says that as Lincoln prepared to sign that document, he took a pen and he moved toward the signature line and he paused for a moment and then he dropped the pen and he stepped away from the table. And when asked what was wrong, he said this. He said, if my name goes into history, it will be for this act. 
And if my hand trembles when I sign it, there will be some who will say he hesitated. Lincoln then turned to the table, took up the pen and boldly signed his name. When it comes to serving Jesus, there is no room for hesitation. When it comes to being a follower, there is no room for hesitation. When it comes to being a man of God, when it comes to being a woman of God, when it comes to being a child of God, there is no room for hesitation. There's not time for us to step back and say, well, I don't know about this. No, we need to step up to the plate and boldly sign our name on the line and say, I'm going to follow after God. I want a heart after God. I want to be a man of God. I want to be a woman of God. I want to be a child of God. And I'm not going to let anything stand in my way.